Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. Welcome. Day 42, we are commencing the book 2 of Psalms. The Lamb upon the throne, how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing, of him who died for me. And healing that might last thing through all eternity. Hallelujah! Crown him with many crowns. Love, behold his hands and sigh. Rich wounds yet visible above in beauty glorify. No angel in the sky can fully bear the sigh, but down was bent whatever I ought mystery so bright. Crown him with many crowns. Welcome, beloved. What a joy to be in the presence of the Lord again to commence this wonderful broadcast again and to be able to share in the Lord's communion. We thank God also for enabling us to, you know, be able to come here today and to magnify the name of the Lord. His name is holy. His name is mighty. His name is majestic. His name is the Amen. We give him all the praise. We give him all the adoration for he reigns forever. He's the mighty God. He's the mighty God, the great I am, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. And we come thirsty to drink before there is a famine in the land. How would you drink water if I told you that there would be no more water again? I'll be coming to you with that. Let's commence with the communion in the name of Jesus. The word of God says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23, I received from the Lord what I also gave unto you. The night the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray for the elements. Our Father, we thank you for the elements that we have at hand. We thank you for the bread. We thank you for the cup. We thank you, Lord, for refreshment. We thank you that it's in the morning watches here. And that, Lord, you've taken care of us here in the night. And, Father, you have been faithful enough. You've given us 42 days. And, Lord, today we are commencing book 2 of the Psalms. Father, we are praying that you may open it more. Reveal to us deep things, deep truths of the Spirit, Lord. Things that we do not know. Things that we have not experienced. Things that we do not um, in any way anticipate, Lord, you are going to reveal to us, Lord God. So we humble ourselves as we commence and we pray for the bread and for the cup. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen and amen.
the deer pants for the streams of water so my soul pants for you oh god my soul thirsts for god for the living god when can i go and meet with god my tears have been my food day and night while men say to me all day long where is your god these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember from the land in Jordan, from the Jordan, the heights of Hammon, from Mount Misa. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waters. All your waves and breakers have swept me over. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go on? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony. As my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Psalm 42, Thirsting for God. Beloved, in the book of Amos, chapter 8, verse 11, the word of the Lord says, I will send a famine on the land. And it will not be a famine of the normal way we know, but it will be a famine of the word of God. You will look for somewhere, you can hear the words of God, and there will be nowhere. Beloved, it is time for us to drink like that deer. Because the deer that is panting for the streams of water is not very sure whether it will be able to take another drink again. The deer is always, if you've been to the game park like I have, you can see what the deer looks like. The deer is looking to every side to see where is the enemy coming from, and then it will drink water. The enemy also knows where to get the deer and the zebra and the buffalo and all those things. During when there is a famine, all of the, them where there is a watering point, that is the most dangerous area of that entire game park. For the, for, the, for the creatures like the, the deer and the, and the buffaloes and all those people. Because the crocodile is waiting in the water. The lion is around there. So is the cheetah. So is the leopard. In Africa, we are blessed by the heritage of wildlife. And this is a great resource that God has put in our hands as the nations of Africa. Also, God has put a lot of gold here in Africa. He's put a lot of diamonds. He put a lot of precious stones here in our continent. He has put also some great, great, amazing crops like the coffee and the tea. And majority of the time, even rubber is coming from here. We have a lot of things in the continent of Africa that are coming from here. But yet again, we see the greed of man turning those places rich in mineral resources into conflict zones where people will be fighting each other and while they are fighting each other the enemy comes and starts to steal their resources from them start taking away their gold starts taking away their their their, 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 their diamonds and their pearls and everything so beloved the thirst of god is what we need right now to hunger and thirst for righteousness. To hunger and thirst for God. That this is the place where you need to find yourself. Deep calls to deep. 
Psalm 42 verse 7. What this simply says, when you look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The deep, the, 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 the surface of the deep, the deep was there. The deep calls to deep. You know, God by his grace and mercy called you and I out of the deep. Glory to God. Thirst for God. Thirst for his things. Desire. Desire more of him. Desire more of him. What a joy that God has enabled us to go through the entire first uh, the portion of Psalms, chapter 1, all the way to chapter 41. We drink from the worldly well instead of the well of life, which is found in Christ. You see, before you can really have a close relationship with God, you must thirst for God. As the deer pants for the streams of water, you must come to that spiritual thirst. Before you come to the spiritual hunger. Because the spiritual hunger is real. God has promised it. That it will come. Have you ever been thirsty? I don't mean a regular thirst. Like when you have been outside out on a, on, a, on a hot day. You know. I mean really, really thirst. Where your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth. <laughs> eh? Thirst. You have to peel your lips off your, your teeth like, hmm? like that. Hmm? Because all you can think of is water and there is no water. The deep thirst for God. A deep thirst. We must come to that place of a deep thirst. Deep thirst. This is one of the most, you know, powerful spiritual symbols in all scripture. As dehydration draws our whole being into a longing for water, so a spiritual void will draw our spirits into a search for a deeper meaning for our lives. A lot of people you see, a lot of people doing so many mistakes with their spirit, some of them opening themselves up to demons. How they do a lot of things and they operate they open doors for the kingdom of darkness to come into their lives. The moment you draw tattoo in your body, as a Christian, you are opening a door through your blood into your life. The reason why you knew, you did not know how powerful a tattoo is, is you try to go with, or if you, are, you have tattoos now, and the one who does not have, you go and say you want to donate blood, the both of you. You will see the one that has tattoos, they will ask, you have tattoos? Do you have any tattoos anywhere? Yes. Okay. So they will look at you in such a way, they may draw your blood, but they may not use it. In another place, some airlines were taking some people for work. And I remember there's one young girl that, one lady actually, she's not a girl that time, but she was very young. She had a tattoo that nobody knew about. It was somewhere hidden at the back of her body. At the back here and there. Around the waist there. So when they went for the examination, nothing. But now they went to a real medical examination and she was not allowed to be among the flight attendants because of just a mark on her body. Now I ask myself, why is it so serious for that particular Middle East airline company not to have anybody with markings on their body? Then I realized, why do people mark? Why do people pierce themselves. Why do they do that? Why do you go ahead and do that? Why do you tattoo your body? Why do you get a piercing? Why do you do that? I found out that it's a thirst for, it's a quest for something. It's, you want to show the world that, you know what, I miss my mom, so I'm writing my mom's name on my hand. I miss, I love my daughter, so I will draw my daughter's hand on, on my hand. You see, the moment you are you don't know what to drink. You will drink anything. And the thirst is what is leading people astray to make decisions that will affect them spiritually. Thirst is the most powerful spiritual symbol. You know, a deep thirst for God himself. You know, 
I believe a deep thirst for God is at the root of a satisfying prayer life. If at all you are struggling in your prayer life, do you have a thirst for God? This is the question. Thirsting and seeking God himself is at the very root of a rich and satisfying prayer life. Desiring God, longing for God as a deer pants for the flowing streams. So my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? I stretch my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Psalm 143 verse 6. Turn to me. Turn with me to John 7, 37 and 39. All the way to 39. John 7. John 7. Thank you, Jesus. John 7. Thank you, Holy Spirit. John 7. 37 to 39. John 7, 37 to 39. It says, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus said, if you are thirsty, come to me and drink. The source, you know, somehow the satisfaction of our souls is found in Jesus. And he tells us to thirst for the living water. And then guess what? When you are thirsty and you take the living water, you yourself become a source of living water. Hallelujah. You know, there are three national feasts in the Jewish calendar. The first is the Feast of the Passover. The second one was known as the Feast of the Pentecost. The third was known as the Feast of the Tabernacles. Now we know that Jesus was speaking during the Feast of Tabernacles. From verse 2 of this, when you are reading this, uh, John 7, you understand that, but when here, when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brother said to him, This, what Jesus is teaching us about fasting, he did at the Feast of Tabernacles. This was a high, happy holiday in the life of a Jew. During the feast, the high priest would go to the pool of Siloam, take a golden pitcher, dip it into that pool, and carry it back into the temple. Then they would pour out the water out of the out on the altar of sacrifice. We are going to see all these things in the book of Leviticus. At that moment, the Levites would blow the trumpets, eh? would blow the shofar. They would be able to sound this sound. Hallelujah! I know you are missing this sound. Let me make this sound. They would blow the. trumpets and after they would blow the trumpets the great crowd would cry out with joy you will draw water out of the wells of salvation that is in Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3 they would be leaping and dancing and shouting and singing and great hallelujahs would fill the air it was the right at this climax, on this great holiday, that Jesus stood up in that crowd with the royal voice, he cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Jesus realized that these people were drinking from the river of ritual. That after this day, they would go back to the same old fears, the same old faults, the same old failures, the same old frustrations. What was wrong with that crowd in that day is that what is wrong with many people today. They are drawing water from the wrong well. Too often, 
Too often we, we quench our thirst in all the wrong places. We drink from the worldly well instead from the well of life which is found in Christ. The problem with many people is they are just not thirsty for God and for spiritual living. You see, because before we can really have a close relationship with God, we have to go, we've got to get thirsty for God. We have to be thirsty for God. I mean, we've got to thirst like the psalmist who said, As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. My soul longs, thirsts for God, for the living God. Psalms 42, 1 and 2. We've got to cry out as David cried out in Psalm 63, verse 1. It says, God, you are my God. Honestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. We must come to a point where we can get before God and say, I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a fasty land. Psalm 143 verse 6. We will never have a cross relationship with God until we fast after him. That is why Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come and let him drink. Isaiah 12 verse 4 verse 3 in the Feast of Tabernacles was one of those scriptures that was proclaimed by the people. They said with joy, will you draw out of the wells of salvation? Hallelujah. We must come to the place of knowing that now is a dispensation of the abundance of the pouring out of water and as the water is poured out as the word of God is poured out we are drinking from the well Jesus himself said come and drink from me and out of him there will be rivers of living water will flow from within your belly there will be an overflow out of your life as you thirst of God you will overflow meaning that the Holy Spirit will flow from your life again you must draw from God's well. John 4, 1 to 23, I'll not be able to, you know, uh, to read it more, but it's about the Samaritan woman. She was desperately trying to fill the void in her life. Her soul was thirsty but not satisfied. Five husband, and on her sixth man, she was looking to get a seventh one probably. She thought Jesus is a potential person. She says in verse 15, Sir, give me this water. My soul is thirsty and dry. She may have been thinking of physical water, but I think she knew Jesus was talking about something much richer and deeper. Now, I want you to relate this to our prayer lives and our thirsting for God as key to a dynamic prayer life. So let's drop down to verse 19 to 24. This is in John chapter 4. 19 to 24. The woman, the Samaritan woman, wants to engage in a relation, religious discussion about the right place to worship, and Jesus cuts to the point. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking for such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is seeking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit, that is from the depth of their being, from the heart, from the center of your being, the heart, the seat of you. That is the heart, the spirit. And truth, according to the truth, rooted in the word of God. That's how we are doing it. Now, when it comes to our prayer lives, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? The answers to your prayers. You know? When it comes to our prayer life, what are you seeking? The answers to your prayers or are you seeking God in spirit and in truth? Ask that question. Why are you in this journey of 150 days of Psalms? Why? What's the reason? If the reason is to get your answers to prayer you know your problems you have problems you want them sorted out that's so now you desire to read the word of god and pray and fast then the god that we serve looks at the intentions of the heart are you seeking god in spirit and in truth unamtafuta bwana kwa roho na kwa kweli ni yeye unamtafuta 
kuna aina tatu za za za, za kiu. There are three three kinds of spiritual thirst that I want to address. Number one is thirst of the empty soul. The unconverted pursuing something to fill their souls. Like the one I'm just telling you of the young people trying to be act trendy, trying to, you know, they're trying to feed some emptiness in them. But they will not be able to find it unless they find Jesus. You cannot be able to fill that void. Ask even anyone who has tried. They can't. It's not possible. It's a God, it's a Christ-shaped void. It's only Jesus who can fix it. Women at the well, men, relationship, money, sex, power, houses, things, sports, hobbies, you know, likes, follows, entertainment, education, popularity, all these things are thirst of the empty soul. Number two, thirst of the dry soul. As experienced the living water, this is that, out of his heart will flow, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Knows therefore what she is missing. So this is a believer who has no longer any time to read the word of God. And yet, can, they know very well what it means not to have the word of God in them. Hallelujah. So it's the thirst of the dry soul. A Christian can become thirsty by drinking the wrong things, going to the wrong well, looking for satisfaction or in some place rather than in God himself. The dry Christian is what the psalmist is describing. As the deer pants for the streams of water, nothing else but the living water of God can be able to, you know, can of God will do for, for that dry soul. Then we have the third one, which is the thirst of the satisfied soul. The satisfied soul thirsts for God precisely because he is satisfied with God. In Psalm 34 verse 8 says, O test and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. He has tested and seen it is good and he wants more. Here is the application to our prayer lives. Help God. I want you fast. That's the prayer. Help. Help me Lord. I want you fast. Not my things, not my answers, not it. I want you fast. Communion with Christ is incomparably satisfying because there is no disappointment in what you find in him. Communion with Christ is incomparably satisfying because there is no disappointment in what you find in him. The spiritual gratification you find in him initially is never ending. He is an infinite universe of satisfaction. There is no lack of satisfaction in Christ. But it is so satisfying that you want more. One drink of Christ satisfies all future tasks of him. Uki, yani, ukionja buwana, ukieza kumuonja, umuambie buwana na kuitaji maishani mwangu. Inatosha, akieza kupa, akieza kuingia maishani mwangu. One thirst, one drink of Christ, satisfies all future thirst for him. There is a man called John Piper, he wrote and said, when you drink my water, your thirst is not destroyed forever. If it did that, would you not feel any, uh, would you feel any need of my water afterward? That is not my goal. I don't want self-sufficient saints. When you drink my water, it makes you a spring. It makes a spring in you. A spring satisfies thirst not by removing a need you have for water but by being there to give you water whenever you get thirsty again and again and again and you begin to help others and begin to bless others and you begin to be a blessing to others that is the reason why out of his belly will flow rivers of living water john chapter 7 37 to 39 help lord i need you first Come to the place of prayer regularly, thirsty for God, ready to drink of the living water that satisfies your soul over and over and over again. We give glory to God for these things.
Beloved, I come to mention to you that God desires us to go deeper in Him. And this is the thirst. You have seen yourself in all those three thirsts. Thirst of the empty soul, thirst of the dry soul, thirst of the satisfied soul. The, the, the one that is already filled with the water. So make sure if you are here as an empty soul, you don't live the same way. You receive Jesus. And then out of your belly will flow springs of living water. The hopelessness will go. The frustrations will go. The things that you are afraid of, they will go away. The old fears, the old frustrations, all those things will go. They are not supposed to be in your life anyway. You need to be focused. You must come to a point where you can get, you know, before God and say, I spread out my hands to you, you know, and my soul longs for you, you know, thirsting after God. This is a beautiful thing when we are thirsting for God. And that's why we have gathered here today. Hallelujah. Before Amos chapter 8 verse 11. Remember, a time is promised of us where there shall be a famine. Hey, a spiritual famine of hearing the words of God. There will be no 150 days of Psalms. There will be no scriptures being proclaimed in the nations. Nobody will proclaim the word of God. It will not be allowed. It will not be available. But now we are in the dispensation of the waters covering the nations with the waters for 150 days. Every single time we show up in a season, it is 150 days of the word that is flowing out in the name of Jesus Christ. We continue to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 1, Proverbs 1, Proverbs 1. That's where we are proclaiming the word of God in the mighty name of Jesus. The Proverbs, the Proverbs, uh, the Proverbs, the Proverbs, that's where we are right now. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right, just, and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to, uh, the, uh, to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of, wisdom, of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Lord, help me not to despise wisdom. Lord, help me not to, have, not to despise discipline in the name of Jesus. Beloved, discipline is something that we all ought to have. That the moment you are in a fasting pool, you are in a, you are, the moment you are in a fast, God is going to help you to discipline yourself. <laughs> On Sunday, I was covering a... A wedding when I was fasting I really thank God for the masks because nobody noticed that I was not eating and I was so glad my crew members were very good to me they helped me and they covered me well so nobody would know that I have not had the meal later on I went and uh, broke my fast at home and it was a good thing that is discipline you can go to a function, everything is there, everything you like, everything sweet and nice and everything is there. But discipline, if you don't despise it, you will be able to say, you know what? I am in a holy fast to the Lord. I desire more of Him. I am thirsty for Him. I am that satisfied soul, but I need more. The one that says, test and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. In Psalm 34 verse 8. Proverbs 1 8. Listen, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a gallant to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, Come along with us, let's lie in wait for someone's blood, let's waylay some harmless soul, let's swallow them alive, like the grave and, and whole, like those who go down to the pit. We will all get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us and we will share a common pass. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. For their feet rush into sin. They are swift to shed blood. How useless 
to spread a net in full view of the birds. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They will lay only themselves. Such is the end of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the lives of those who get it. Are you seeing that proverb? It's saying that when you are lying, lying in wait for another person's blood, it's actually you who is relaying yourself. Because that's the shortcut to the kingdom of darkness. Such is the end of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the lives of those who, are, who get it. Proverbs 1.20 Wisdom calls aloud in the streets. She raises her voice in the public squares. At the end of the noisy streets, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? If you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. But since you rejected me when I called and no one gave heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, in turn, I will turn, in turn, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, and they will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurned my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Beloved, look and seek for wisdom. Fear the Lord more. Desire, thirst for him, and this will be your lot that you will be at ease without fear of harm. You will live in safety, you will be at ease, and you without harm will move on day after day because you fear the Lord, because you thirst after the living water and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water because you are never going to thirst again when the Lord is in your life. When you drink the water of life, you will never thirst again because you will become a source of that water. Ecclesiastes 9. It says, So I reflected on all this. I'm reading Ecclesiastes 9 in the NIV 1984 version. So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and they and what they do are in God's hands. But no man knows whether love or hate awaits him. All share a common destiny. The righteous, the righteous and the wicked, the fear, the, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good man, so with the sinner. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. Verse 3. This is the evil that I have seen happen under the sun. The same destiny overtakes them all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil and there is madness in their hearts while they live. And afterward, they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a dead lion, even, even a live dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, their, their, their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Let me pause there and minister to you who is bereaved. 
I know at the moment of the bereavement, things are very, very fresh to you. You keep asking God many questions. Why? You know, why did they have to go so early? Why did they die? But you know what? They know nothing. They can never answer you. When they die, they die. They are forgotten. So it is for us, the living, that we have that knowledge that we will die. But the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. So even if you build a big thing for them, you, you know, I, I saw one, one, one clip that was passing of this uh, gang leader in one of the countries that they buried him with a lot of gold and notes and all that. And I believe some gang members came at night. They went, opened the cemetery, stole all the money, stole all the jewelry, removed his shoes, everything, and they left him there for dead. Now, the people would be like, oh, why have they done that? Don't you remember? Let me tell you, the dead know nothing. There is no further reward. So you who is under the living, thirst after God. There is no thirsty. There is no thirst when one is dead. There is no thirst when one is finishing their work. Listen what he says, verse 7. Go eat your food. And drink your wine with a joyful heart. For it is now that God favors what you do. Always be clothed in white. And always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love. All the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. So those three, work, knowledge, planning. Those three things are what you need for a good, successful life. In your work, in your working. Neither working, neither planning, neither knowledge. So those three, make sure they are part of your daily activities. Work, plan, and no, and receive wisdom. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not for the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly on them. I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only few people in it, and a powerful king came against it and surrounded it and built huge siege works against it. Verse 15. Now there lived in that city a man, poor but wise. He saved the city by his wisdom, but nobody remembered the poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Beloved, I speak wisdom upon us. May the Lord give us wealth and riches. Because the poor man's wisdom is despised. You will not be despised. I decree and declare over your life, favor will meet favor in your life. You will experience the supernatural and you will not be counted among the poor wise men. You will be counted among the rich wise men in the name of Jesus. Amen and women. Let's move on to the book of uh, Leviticus 2. Glory to God. Leviticus 2. Leviticus 2. Hallelujah. Leviticus, I love the way it says, holiness to the Lord. Ah, I love Leviticus. You know, Leviticus, when you are reading the, through the Bible, sometimes you just feel like skipping Leviticus and Numbers. But we will not skip anything. We will go through chapter and verse all the way. And I will be happy to report when we completely complete uh, proclaiming the entire scriptures. The Lord is helping us. Leviticus 2.1 when someone brings a grain offering to the Lord, his offering is to be of fine flour. He is to pour oil and put incense on it, and take it to Aaron's sons, the priests. The priest shall take a handful of the fine flour and oil together with the incense, 
and burn this as a memorial portion on the altar, an offering made by fire, a pleasing, a, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons. It will, it is a most holy part of the offerings made to the Lord by fire. If you bring a grain offering baked in an oven, it is to consist of fine flour, cakes made without yeast and mixed with oil and wafers made without yeast and spread with oil. Leviticus 2.5 If your grain offering is prepared on a griddle, it is to be made of fine flour mixed with oil and without yeast. Crumble it and pour it or can pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. Leviticus 2 7. If your grain offering is cooked in a pan, it is to be made of fine flour and oil. Let me mention before you go to verse 7 that these commands are being given. One, if it is baked in an oven. Two, if it is prepared on a griddle. Three, if it is cooked in a pan. That shows three different levels of people who are offering. I will come back to this another time. We have to move quickly as the Lord helps us. It says, Bring the grain offering made of these things to the Lord, present it to the priest, and who shall take it to the altar? He shall take out the memorial portion for the grain offering and burn it on the altar as an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the offerings made to the Lord by fire. Every grain offering you may you bring to the Lord must be made without yeast. For you are to burn, you are not to burn any yeast or honey in an offering made to the Lord by fire. Mm. You may bring them to the Lord as an offering of first fruits, but they are not to be offered on the altar as a pleasing aroma. Honey and yeast. Don't bring them as burning offerings. Burnt offerings. Verse 14. If you bring a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, offer crushed heads of new grain roasted in the fire, put oil and incense on it. It is a grain offering. The priest shall burn the memorial portion of the crushed grain and the oil together with all the incense as an offering made to the Lord by fire. Glory to God. That is Leviticus 2. I command, I command that you may go on for further studying in your time. We now move on to the book of 2 Thessalonians by the grace of God. 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonians is where we are. We are concluding the book of 2 Thessalonians and tomorrow we commence the book of Timothy. Hallelujah. By the time we are done with the 150 days of Psalms, we will have gone through the entire New Testament and through the book of Ephesians, we will have gone 25 times. So this is no uh, place where you are going to say you don't know the Lord. You will know him. You will see him in the word. You will be part of him. You will know the scripture and you will be so surprised that this many years you have known the Lord. You could have just been doing what you are doing now. And definitely you will achieve your goal faster of serving God as a living well. Hallelujah. That you are a living well. Out of your belly springs the rivers of living water. So yourself you are a well. Eh? You understand? What type of a well are you? What people are what are people drawing? What are people drawing from you? We shall talk about that again. Second Thessalonians 3. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored, just as it is with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful. And he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 6. It says, keep away from every brother who is idle. And does not live according to the teaching you received from us. You hear that? If at all unakaa pale base, neno la mungu linakuambia toka base, 
usikae na watu wako idol unasikia hii ni maneno ya Mungu inasema Second Thessalonians 3:6 It says in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we command you brothers to keep away from every brother who is idol and does not live according to the teaching you received from us For you yourselves know that you ought to follow our example we were not idol when we were with you nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it on the contrary we worked night and day laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you we did this not because we do not have the right to such help but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow man of god write books write books work do something for the lord if you have been graced like what we have been graced to do work with your hands do something because it is not for us to be a burden to the body of christ the offering that your people are going to give is not supposed to be what is keeping you to serve god in fact when you give an offering it's for your blessing when you think when you give an offering you are helping your pastor you are very wrong if you go and find out the man of god that is serving with you is ever busy you not find them they are just seated they are working for god working with you calling talking to people counseling that is work it should be rewarded hallelujah if you go and pay a marriage counselor to listen to your problems how much are you going to pay in us dollars or kenya shillings but you will find time to talk to a man or woman of god and then you think that that is just supposed to be free because they are men of god they are women of god they are just supposed to help you for free then the moment you go and you are told in the hospital go and look for a something therapist you go to that that person and you start paying lots of shillings and dollars and then you come back to the man of god empty handed and still want him to assist you this man of god works it is not idol what he is doing he is not an idol man you need to understand this because this scripture tells us very well that we have such right to this help but in order so that we don't we make ourselves a model for you to follow i believe god that he will establish and enable us to know and to understand this and to honor the word of god by standing with the men of god that teach and bring the word of god to you second corinthians second thessalonians 3:10 hallelujah it says for even when we were with you we gave you this rule if a man will not work he shall not eat we hear that some of you are idle they are not busy they are busy bodies such people we command and urge in the lord jesus christ to settle down and earn the bread the bread they eat and as of you my brothers never tire doing what is right if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter let take special note of him do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed they may feel ashamed you yet do not do not regard him as an enemy but warn him as a brother now may the peace may the lord of peace give you peace at all times in every way the lord be with all of you i paul write this greeting in my own hand which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters this is how i write the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all second thessalonians 3 make sure you share this scripture a lot with the people that are just waiting and sitting and saying there is no work there is work there is so much to do you cannot be idle even just studying the word of god applying it sharing with others this is work don't wait for you to say that now i'm going to an office that now that's work work is now now work <laughs> in the grave no work in the grave no planning no wisdom no skill nothing there now here work we move on to ephesians 6 as we come to the book of ephesians another time children obey your parents in the lord for this is right honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long on earth fathers do not exasperate your children instead bring them up in the training and the instruction of the lord 
Verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly, as if you are serving the Lord, not men. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not trick them, do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and, the mighty, and in his mighty power. Ephesians 6, 11, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, uh, powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to, distinguish, to, to extinguish all the flaming darts of the enemy. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, always be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I declare it fearlessly as I should. Ecclesiastes, Ephesians 6, 21. Tichikas, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you may also know, so that you also know, may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God and Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. I receive that grace. I love the Lord Jesus with an undying love. We move on to the uh, book of Revelation. Revelation 1. Hallelujah. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Which, gave, which God gave him to show his servants what soon, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. That is Revelation 1 4. Grace and peace to you, to him who is and who was and is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 1.7 Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who was, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet.
which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his, face, around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the vo or the, or his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you see, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. I want you to understand this about the, the book of Revelation, verse 19. It says, whatever you have seen, that is the present, what is now and what will take place later. Verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels and the seven and the seven of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches beloved everything in the realm of the spirit is a mystery and you know what that mystery is found in christ as we conclude you're here you have not given your life to jesus or you are backslidden or you feel like you are that empty soul that needs to be that dry soul that desires the feeling of the water I pray that you will receive salvation. The word of Romans chapter 10 verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. What a joy and blessing to know this truth. What a joy and blessing to be able to share it with you in this very day. So I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I believe in my heart, God raised him from the dead. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. I am born again. The old is gone, the new has come. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and with your fire. In Jesus' name, Amen. Sema bwana yesu, nakiri kwa kinywa changu, ya kwamba wewe ni bwana, na amini kwa moyo wangu, Ya kwamba mungu alikufufua siku ya tatu Andika jina langu katika kitabu chako cha uzima wa milele Nimeokoka ya zamani ya mekwisha yale mapya ya mekuja Ni jaze na roho mtakatifu na moto wako Katika jina la yesu Amen Amen and amen Let me pray as we conclude now Father I thank you for these souls I thank you for the men that have been transformed, that have been touched. Lord God, I thank you for the thirst of God. I thank you, Lord, that as you help us to pray in the prayer meeting, the Lord, you will help us more. So, Father, we pray for them that are watching this. The Lord, let your hand be upon them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen and amen and amen. We give glory to God. We give him praise. We give him all the adoration. We give him the praise. We give him glory. After this, we'll be doing a prayer meeting on the Google Meet. If at all you are watching this on YouTube and you know you are, it's not live for you, you can always drop your number there and we'll be able to get in touch with you. So the Lord bless you. Shalom. I am Malcolm David. Kwaheri Barakam.